we're going to derive a very important governing equation, the heat diffusion equation. We're going to derive it in Cartesian coordinates, um, and in the next video we'll extend it to cylindrical coordinates. The heat diffusion is at heart an energy balance. Now before we delve too deeply into this derivation, let's look at the energy balance. Um, so this is the energy balance that you're familiar with from thermodynamics. It says that the rate of change of energy stored within that control volume is equal to the net amount of energy transferred across the system boundary into the control volume. In other words, the rate of energy transfer in minus the rate, rate of trans energy transfer out. Um, we know that we have several ways that energy can cross the system, but in this class we'll focus only on heat transfer. So the net of energy transferred into the system is really the net amount of uh, heat transfer into the system. So all that looks familiar, but in this class, we will also consider uh, heat generation. That term might be due to resistive heating or some exothermic or endothermic uh, chemical or nuclear reaction taking place within that solid, uh, within that solid or stationary fluid system. And the goal of all of this is to come up with an equation for the temperature as a function of x, y, z, and t, where t is time. All right, so now we're start, ready to start deriving. Let's take a differential control volume with dimensions dx, dy, dz. The rate of the change of energy stored within that system is given by E dot with a little subscript st. Um, and another way to think of that term would be de dt. So if the process of interest had been going on long enough to reach steady state conditions, that term would be zero. Then we have the rate of heat transfer uh, entering the system at location X on the left-hand side and the rate of heat transfer exiting the temperature or exiting the system at some location X plus DX on the right-hand side. Those two heat transfer terms are not necessarily equal to each other, although it's certainly possible that they could be. We can define heat transfer vectors at the other faces as well. All of that, those vectors, Q, make up the second term. Um, next we'll have the rate of thermal energy generation within the system, which is the last, uh, last term in the energy balance equation at the very top. While, as we've mentioned, most heat transfer in the real world is multidimensional, we're going to start simply with one dimensional heat transfer, say, in the x direction. We need to define the surface area that the heat transfer vector at x and x plus dx are crossing perpendicularly. This differential area, dA, is the product of dy and dz. So here's that general equation for the conservation of energy, including the heat generation term. We're going to handle each of those terms one at a time. Let's work our way from left to right, starting with the energy storage term. That's the rate of energy change that's stored within the control volume over time. And that should look familiar to us. Um, recall from, your, from the first law of thermodynamics for a control mass, which is what we have here. Remember, it's a solid or a stationary fluid. Um, kinetic and potential energy changes are assumed to be uh, con or negligible. Um, and note how, note the units here. We've taken the big U and factored out mass to get the change in little u. Um, we're typically talking about an internal energy change for an incompressible substance, solid or a stationary liquid, with moderate temperature changes, so we can assume constant specific heats. Sometimes you'll see it, it written at, out as CP or CV or just C. It doesn't really matter really because CV equals CP equals CV for an incompressible substance, and that's something you learned in thermodynamics. Now, <clears throat> let's put mass in terms of density times that differential control volume, which is dx times dy times dz. And then, for reasons that will become apparent later, we'll, we'll plug everything together and simplify. We'll write this term in, uh, in terms of area, really the differential area, through which Q flows through perpendicularly. Now let's look at the net rate of energy into the control volume. 
that's q at some location x minus the q at some location x plus dx. And we need to figure out how those two terms are related to one another. So let's draw q as a function of x. Function of q might look like this. It doesn't really matter what we draw it like at this moment. We're just trying to develop some mathematical relationships that are going to be helpful to us. At some location x, we have a specific value of q, which we'll write on the y-axis as q with a subscript x. We could do the same thing to define q uh, evaluated at some location x plus dx, which is where the top dotted line and the rightmost vertical line cross over the curve for qx. This straight line is the slope of the function q at some particular x, some particular location x. And the dot that I've drawn here is on the slope at some location x plus dx. Now let's look at the coordinate of that point. The y coordinate of that point is, of this dot, is super close to the y coordinate, the value of x, uh, of q at x plus dx. So what we're going to do is take a closer look at this point. Zooming in, let's just get our bearings and tie what we see on the graph at the top, uh, or see what we see on the graph to the figure at the top, so we have a sense of what these things represent. So Qx is the heat flux or heat transfer vector at some location x, which is on the left side, left face of the control volume on the figure. Q at x plus dx is the heat transfer vector out of the control volume at the right, at the right face at x plus dx. Now back to that red dot. We see that the distance between x and x plus dx is just dx. And then we define the change in y as dy. Don't confuse that dy with the dy referring to one of the lengths on the control volume. Um, we're just defining it like this to talk about the definition of the slope. So the definition you learn for slope is dy over dx. Now you can see that the y coordinate at y plus dy is equal to q evaluated at some location x plus that dy, that, that distance there. That is, once again, pretty darn close to Q evaluated at location X plus DX, which is what we're trying to get an equation for. Let's define that slope in terms of the change in Q as a function of X over DX. Then, equating the two definitions for the slope and rearranging things, we get an equation for DY. And remember that solving for dy will allow us to uh, a way to approximate q at some location x plus dx. Um, we need to define the rate of heat transfer going in at some location x, which is the q with a subscript x, and then minus the, the rate of heat transfer at some location x plus dx, which is the q with a little subscript x plus dx. Using our approximation for Q at location X plus DX, we get an approximation for the quantity that we're after, um, which is this. Now your book shows this approximation by using the first two terms in a Taylor series, um, which you may remember from calculus. This right here is exactly how the formula is written in a typ typical calculus book. I'm going to write things a little bit differently, um, putting things in terms of the variables that I'm, that I'm looking at. And now we're going to replace those generic f of x terms with q terms. And you can see how the terms line up. The f at x plus dx is q evaluated x plus dx. The f of x is q evaluated at some location x. And the first derivative of, f of, um, f of x is the first derivative of q evaluated at x. And then, of course, that x plus dx minus x is just going to be equal to dx.
Um, but either way we look at it, we get the exact same thing. So this is something to memorize. We use it quite a lot. We're now on the third and final term in the energy balance, the rate of energy generation. Now in your book, they don't always put a subscript GE, uh, GEN, GEN, when referring to the rate of energy generation. Um, so just be aware of that. This term, like the other terms in your energy balance, is in watts. Um, you'll often see this expressed as a volumetric heat generation term, which is also in watts per unit volume. So let's put everything together. We have the rate of change of energy stored within the system equals the net rate of heat transferred into and out of the system plus the rate of heat being generated in the system. Let's put that last terms in terms of the volumetric heat generation. And then um, since we're talking about a differential control volume, let's put that volume in terms of dx, dy, dz. And remembering that that area A is equal to dy, dz, we could put the differential control volume in terms of A times dx. We can apply Fourier's law and put that Qx in terms of K, A, and the temperature gradient. Assuming that K and A do not change with location, we take those constants out of the derivative and write the temperature gradient as a second derivative with respect to x. Now we divide through by the volume to get rid of a few terms um, and simplify the equation and then divide through by k which allows us to get things in terms of thermal diffusivity which you recall from the, the previous video and you have the heat conduction for 1d conduction with constant k, constant thermal properties. Uh, we can also extend this out to three dimensions as well if we need. Um, next we'll extend this to uh, this equation to cylindrical coordinates and then we'll talk about boundary conditions and how we can actually use this equation. Um, all right, well, thank you for watching and let me know if you have any questions.